Well, as uh, Pastor Joe said and Sheila said, this was an exciting week to be around here. We had almost 400 kids that filled these sanctuary pews and this building with a lot of joy. And I'm telling you, they brought the joy. So first of all, you need to raise your game a little bit today and come with a little bit of joy because this building was just... I, I could see why Jesus said, let the children come to me because it was so exciting to be in this place today. But I think about that, 400 and all the logistics and the things that went into putting on a VBS just even to feed that many kids with a lot of different opinions about what they should have, right? It's a pretty amazing thing. Now, uh, how many of you are a person that you said, I love to host a good dinner? I love any, anyone out there that you say, I love to host a good dinner. There's a few of you out there. How many of you are like me and I like to go to a person's house who is hosting a good dinner and just eat and enjoy, right? Amazing how many more hands are up for the second one. Uh, it's true. There's something about just having this beautiful meal and being able to enjoy that with with other people. It's a beautiful thing. So a couple things I want to know. How many people have been to a Twins game? Okay, most of you have been. 38,000 or so people. Imagine all the things that go into figuring out how to feed all those people. Uh, a couple weeks from now, one of our favorite times of the year, the Minnesota State Fair. How many of you are Minnesota State Fair people? I mean, amazing to think about 1.3 million people that are going to be a part of that, right? Uh, what it goes into feeding that many people. Uh, anyone been to a taste of Chicago? Fewer people. Three million people will go to that event, which is pretty amazing. And, and anyone been to, to Germany for Oktoberfest? Okay, a couple of you have been. Uh, they expect about six million people to partake in that. And so I did a little research to figure out what does it take to to feed groups like that. So for example, a taste of Chicago, it takes about a hundred food vendors to feed all those people, which is pretty amazing if you start to do the math and figure that out. At the Minnesota State Fair, there are over 300 different food vendors to, to make sure that you get your cookies and uh, corn dogs. But this is the one that, that kind of got to me. In Germany, it takes six large breweries six large breweries to provide two million gallons of beer. Do that math. Two million gallons of beer for six million people. I'm telling you, if you ever want to be an Uber driver, that's the place to go in October. And crazy, right? And, and I think about, like, I'm not, a, uh, the logistics part of it just drives me crazy to figure all those things out. So uh, one of the things I did in, in my past, I was the director of the youth gathering, and so we would bring 22,000 plus youth and adults uh, to a city, and we'd have about five days that we were in charge of feeding them. By the way, not a fun event uh, to feed five uh, to 20,000 teenagers, right? All they want is chicken fingers, by the way. Uh, what we learned is this, that Tyson's chicken actually redistributed their, their system every time there was a gathering because all the restaurants would run out of chicken fingers. So, well, the things you learn, right? But it was our job, one of the toughest things to do was to feed that many youth who have a very particular love for food. Mostly fast food, and, and most downtowns do not accommodate high school kids. And so we would bring together and do some different things, and we'd bring a group of planners together, and we would figure out how do we feed them. And it would take about a year and a half to work with the city and to try to figure those things out. In 2019, we hosted it in, uh, down at the U.S. Bank Stadium right here in Minneapolis, and it was absolutely amazing. We had to have this event uh, that was kind of like a mini state fair because uh, we were trying to feed about 17,000 high schoolers. And so we brought in 25 food trucks, and we brought in a caterer that did this big state fair thing, but it took a year and a half to plan it. To which makes me wonder, as we get into the gospel lesson today, uh, why didn't we just ask Jesus to do it? <laughs> like, seriously, one, he's like, all right, 
just have them sit down, I'll feed them, right? <laughs> it's a pretty amazing thing. And as I was getting into this, I, I love this story, and a lot of you have heard this a lot of different times, right? But what I noticed this time as I was sitting in this scripture is that, that actually I don't think the Holy Spirit didn't keep my focus in on this miracle moment. What he did is he focused me on two different things, and I'm going to go a little bit different today. He focused me on the crowds and the disciples. And so we're going to look at those two things today, the crowd and the disciple. And I think there is a distinct difference of what is happening in this moment with those two. So first of all, we know this. The gospel tells us that there were 5,000 men plus women and children. So we know it's, a impre- it's an incredible crowd, right? And, and I start to think about, like, who are the people that make up this crowd? We know that Jesus just learned that his friend John the Baptist had died, and he wanted to get away to a desolate place and grieve. But imagine this. The word about Jesus had spread so much that this crowd of people, 5,000 plus, we don't know how big that was, but they heard where he was going to go despite the fact that he wanted to grieve, and they followed him to this desolate place. And you think about, like, why, what, would, what would be going on in their lives that they would give up whatever they've got going on to make sure that they follow this Jesus? Well, we know he said he healed some people, so some people came with the healing and said, hey, I've tried everything else. I'm going to try this Jesus because I'm hearing some things. Let's go follow him and, and get a healing. We know that some probably had a curiosity. I've heard stories about who he is, and I just want to be in his presence to see kind of what happens. Uh, some we know he, that skeptics followed him. We're trying to catch him with things. The Pharisees and the the religious leaders who did not like him uh, would also follow him. So you have this crowd that's made up and they've got all their own stories, their own wants, their own desires, their own agendas. But here's something great about a crowd. Think about this. When you go to an event, you get to call the shots. You get to decide when you want to go. You get to decide when you want to leave. As long as the state fair is feeding me, I'm going to stay. But when I'm full and I'm tired and I'm ready to go home, I can leave. That's the great thing about being in a crowd. You can kind of call the shots in the midst of this. So there's the crowd. And then there's the disciples. And I think in the last three to four years, one of the things that the Holy Spirit is pressing in on me is this moment that Jesus calls his disciples and said this. He took 12 men, 12 men, and he said this, what I'm going to do is I want to live life with you for three years. And we look, when we go through the Gospels, Jesus spent more time with these 12 than he did with the crowds. And we love to talk about the crowd stories, but Jesus invested the most time in those 12. Living life together, experiencing life together. It was where he invested the most time. And and I started to think about what was going on in this particular passage. What was Jesus doing? And Jesus is constantly a teacher. In fact, in the Greek, disciple means learner, student. A student before the master, hungry to know, like, I'm here, and, and Jesus helped me to move there. And I think what's interesting in this is Jesus, in this parable, or not the parable, in this story, Jesus is about to teach a lesson. And I love this. He gives them the test before he gives them the lesson. And in John, it says this. It says that Jesus already knew what he was going to do before he asked them this question. That's an important thing, right? Like, I know where I'm going to go. I know what I'm going to do, but I want to see how they react because as a student, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you a test and then we're going to teach. And so he says, hey, by the way, we've, uh, there's a lot of people here. What should we do? And I love what the disciples say because I think I would do the same thing. Wow, that's a lot of people. This is a desolate place. I mean, this is, this is a Sunday and we only have a Chick-fil-A in town, right? We just, There's not a lot of options here, Jesus, right? And so he says this in verse 15. He says, well, what are we going to do? And the disciples say, send them away. Send them away. Let them go figure it out on their own. Uh, 
I, we just don't have the resources to do that. And, and it isn't that typical, right? Like, I, I, it's not my problem. It's not, feeding these people is not my issue. That's not on my task to do today. Let them go figure it out on their own. And I love what Jesus says. I love what Jesus says next in verse 16 and, and 16 and 18. He says, actually, what I'm doing is I'm bringing you to focusing on yourself, to focusing on other people. That that actually is a part of walking with me is I want you to be focused not on it's not my problem to I want to have a heart for these people. Because when Jesus looked, it said Jesus looked in the crowd and had compassion on them. And I want you, when you look at people, to have compassion on people. And so he says this, uh, they need not go away. They need not go away. Bring what you have to me. Bring your resources. See, I love this. The disciple says, I, I, we just don't have enough to do this. I don't have the resources to do this. And Jesus says, well, wait a second. It's not about what you can do. It's about what I can do. Bring your resources and put them in my hands and see what happens. And, and I love what happens next. In verse 20, it says this, that all ate and were satisfied. So think about this. You have the crowd and you have the disciples, right? All ate and all were satisfied. Both groups got to experience the beauty of that moment. But, but, the disciples got to experience something that the crowds didn't get to experience. And what they got to experience, and you don't get this in the English translation. If you go into the Greek, I love it. There's one word that the Greek uses that just doesn't come out in the English, and it's this word, parousio. When Jesus describes this moment, he says this. And now imagine this. Just take for a moment what, what happens, right? You take these five loaves and these two fish and you bring before Jesus. And I don't know what happened in that moment for this miraculous thing. But as he sits him down, imagine this. Twelve disciples he has, right? And, and so you, you can't just pass out for 5,000 plus people in one single thing, right? So imagine what the disciples must have been thinking as they, they went and they got some stuff and then they, they went and passed out and they had to go back and they get some stuff and pass it out to more people. Can you imagine what they were thinking in this moment going, well, wait a second, do you, do you know, was there other bread and fish that were here? Like, there had to be the moment they're going, oh my, who is this that can do something like this? We know it wasn't the first time, but who is this that can take five loaves and two fish and provide? But what I really love what Jesus does next is he says this, I want you to take baskets and I want you to pick up what's left over. And I think he did that because he was teaching each of them an important kingdom principle. And it's this principle of parousio. It's this element that says, parousio says exceedingly more. It's this thing of abundance. See, that's what happens when you put your resources in kingdom hands is a parousio, an exceedingly more opportunity that happens in the midst of that. And as they're picking it up, I, I got to imagine they're thinking, oh my word, you know what? In the kingdom, in the kingdom, when we start focusing on that, the resources that I have, I end up with more than I started with. That's a kingdom thing. I have more left over than what we started with. And so Jesus is, is, is teaching them in the midst of what does this look like? That's the, that's the parousia of the kingdom. And I, I, one of the things that he was trying to do constantly with his disciples was to say this, I am not an event, I am an, I'm a relationship. And I want you to pursue from this event to relationship side. And so I started thinking about this a little bit more in my own walk. Because I think the difference between the crowd and disciple mentality is this, and it's this very important question. The crowd is often focused in on yourself. Like, what's in it for me? It's about myself. And so think about this question for a second. Is, is this a me agenda item or a Jesus agenda item? And if we're honest, so many times when we approach faith, it becomes about me and what I get. That's why it's so easy for people today, when something doesn't go right in their church, they just go to and find a church that works for them, right? Because it's about me and my stuff. 
And my question is, before you were to leave that place, is it, is it a you item or is it a Jesus item? There are times that it's a Jesus item where you leave. I would say any time the church doesn't preach the word of God, that is a Jesus item. That's not a me item. You leave. I, I would say that with this, right? Like any time you think, like, we don't preach, we're not preaching the word, the first thing I would say, get up and leave. Sorry, Joe. Is that probably should, right? That's, that's a Jesus item. That's not a me item. And so you start thinking about like all the questions that we start to have. Is it a me thing or is it a Jesus thing? Is this Jesus thing is about kingdom thinking. And so Jesus is helping them think. Um, a me item is send them away. It's not, it's not my job. And Jesus says, no, a kingdom item is it is yours. I want you to have compassion. I want you to think about them. That is what the kingdom is about. And, and because of this, I, I, I'm just convinced that Jesus... The reason why he said in ministry, I am devoting myself to, to 12 people is because I think when that happens, when you get 10 to 12 people together that's focused on kingdom stuff, on Jesus agenda stuff, what starts to happen is you experience something the crowds don't get to see. You get to experience the parousia of the kingdom. You get to see the way that God moves in a way that only God can move. You get a peek behind the curtain and you're like, well, wait a second, we just had this, but look what God did with that. You get to see things that most people don't get to see. I love that about VBS this week. When you're behind the scenes, you get to see things that not most people get to see. And we can celebrate, we can try to tell you about it, and you're like, well, that's great, and we let all these kids and stuff like this. But it's amazing the stories that were coming on. I want to encourage you to go and to read some of those things, those God sightings and what God was doing. I mean, the Holy Spirit was working on each of those kids and those leaders here like he was doing something. And I believe he's saying, disciples, when you, when you focus on a relationship with me and you focus on my agenda, I'm going to show you things that only I can show you. And so I started thinking about this. About a year ago, uh, I, I would say the, the, probably where I have seen God move the most in my life is when in uh, groups that my wife and I have got to walk with, uh, 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 small groups, right? We've had three small groups that we've significantly gotten to walk with in many different ways. And this last year, we, we just felt a little bit convicted and we were in the city that we were in. And we said, you know what, Here, we're going to do something a little different. And we just opened it up to people in the city. And we, we, we kind of sent it out. We had about 43 invites we sent out and said, hey, by the way, uh, my wife and I, most, we don't know you, but we know that, that, you're, uh, that you, you have some kind of a loose affiliation with the church that we were at at that time. And we would love just to come together with a group of people and to focus in on Jesus' life and what Jesus was all about. We want to be more and more like Jesus. And we just want a, a group of people to come alongside of us and pursue that with us. And so here's what, we just sent it out, right? And 18 people said yes. 18. We were, we were amazed. And so we got together, we started getting to know each other, and it was a little uncomfortable because most of us didn't really have a clue what was going on. And then we just spent the next year reading the Gospels. We watched the Chosen series and had a lot of different discussions in the midst of it. But what was amazing is I think the parousia of the kingdom started to happen in the midst of that. As this group, uncomfortable as they were, started to focus in on Jesus' agenda, things started to happen. What I love is there was a group of people, all kinds of prayer needs. We started praying for people in our life that didn't know Jesus, and we started to see some things happen in the midst of that. We had people that were walking with people that, were, that needed healing in their life, and we started praying that, God, would you heal them? Would you, would you do something that only you could do? And we got to celebrate some of the healing and moments that happened in, into that life. We had two people in that group that were struggling with addiction and felt so convicted by it, they said, I got to turn from this. And we got to see them confess and to ask God to help them with that and to surrender from those addictions. And we got to see healing in the midst of that. We saw a marriage in the midst of that that said, you know what? We are not walking in the way that God's calling us to walk in. And we're kind of walking away from each other that all of a sudden started to walk towards each other. And we saw, as the group said, hey, would... Would, can you guys come together and can we renew our vows together? We got to experience that in the midst of that. 
We have one person at the end who did not want to be a part of this group. What said, groups are not my thing. Not my thing. Um, but his wife dragged him along. And in the, in the midst of this, what started to happen is he started to see Jesus in a different way. And in two weeks, we are going to go to a local river. And we're going to baptize him. There's something beautiful about being in a group of people focused in on Jesus and what Jesus is all about. And I believe the parousia of the kingdom starts to happen. And I'm telling you, every time we're just picking up baskets, we're just picking up pieces and going, oh my word, we have more now than what we started with. We're seeing changes now that we didn't even imagine that that was going to happen. And so I want to encourage you, this fall, this fall, so you've got some time to pray about it. If you're not a part of a group of people, whether it's a beautiful saver or it's outside of, this, uh, outside of this church too, I want to encourage you to pray about, God, are you leading me to be a part of a group of 10 to 12 people that are focused in on what you are doing and where you're leading? Because here's the reality. I believe you will experience things in that group that you won't in the crowd. Because it's not about, the church is not an event, it's a relationship. And it's about pursuing that relationship and seeing what that relationship has for you. And I believe it's the parousia of the kingdom. I I believe you will see things that you can't even imagine because of what God's going to do. And it's easy to start to think of those me questions. But I believe that Jesus in this season is calling us to surrender those questions because he wants to teach us. And not individually, but together. And so this fall, we're going to have an opportunity. And if you haven't had a chance uh, to, to, to connect here, if you haven't had a chance to be in relationships with someone, I, I know Jen is amazing, and she will find a way with her team to connect you with other people willing to focus in on the kingdom. And I believe there's blessing for you in that. And so I want to encourage you in the midst of that is just to pray, God, what are you doing? Where are you leading? What are you calling me to do? Because I believe that what God wants you to do is to bring your small offering of time and your small desire, Lord, I want to be more like you, and to bring it to his hands and watch what he does. And I believe the best moments are ahead of you in that. Let's pray about it. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we are so grateful for what you can do. Lord, how you can bring such small resources and put them into your hands and do kingdom stuff. God, we see you at work all over the place. And help us to stop and to focus on you. Lord, may this be not just something we do and not an event we go to, but Lord, may it be a relationship. And may we grow closer to you because we know, God, in that relationship that that you will speak and you will show us things that only you can show us. Lord, we ask this all in your name and for the sake of your kingdom. And all God's people said, Amen.